I am actually humbled uh, to speak with um, such a uh, generous and um, excellent speakers as to Sadiq, thank you, um, Pico and uh, Ogar and Albertino. Uh, my talk really is going to be an evidence-based free zone, as, uh, as many people would say. So I've been given really hard um, topic. I think I gave it to myself, to tell you the truth. Um, I don't know why. It is going to be quick because I'm the chair and we are going to finish on time. Um, but let me start here. And we have a beautiful world uh, that is so diverse. But it's interesting to think about the fact we have the issue of globalization. And globalization is characterized by the growing interdependence of the world's people and involves the integration of economies, culture, technology, and governance. Now, we're here today, and I think this is particularly important, the World Heart Failure Society is important for representing the voices and the regions that are not necessarily dominating the globalization of the world. So it's important that there is some representation beyond the traditional powers. And globalization can have a good effect, maybe this is one of them, but it also can have a bad effect. If, for example, we infect the rest of the world, as been suggested already, uh, with poor health behaviors and moving away from traditional lifestyles. Having said that, it's important to think that we tend to romanticize um, traditional lifestyles. And it's no wonder that the people who are offered more opportunity and wealth take that opportunity, accepting some of the risks that come with that and the poor behaviors. If you look across the globe, heart failure is truly a global problem. Um, but as you've seen already, um, it is well described in some regions and not in the other. So the first thing to say is the critical importance, as Albertino uh, has, has mentioned and Ogar has mentioned, about uh, establishing a network of registries. And you've seen some examples from Sudan. Uh, you've seen them from Nigeria, um, from South Africa, and the centers through, th through thesis. That it's really important to understand the dynamics of heart failure across the globe, and particularly in regions where there is a paucity of data. And I, in truth, become very frustrated when I see these beautiful Lancet publications on the burden of disease, and I go, wow, where did the data come from? Because I haven't seen that data. And of course, it's extrapolated on extrapolated. And then I go to uh, the World Congress of Cardiology in Melbourne, and a, a North American speaker from, from Harvard or whatever else will get up and say, well, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are X amount of cases, and this is what actually happens, and I'm going, I don't know where this information comes from, but he speaks it with such conviction, and the audience all say, wow, okay, that's, that's the problem in Africa. Well, that, as you've seen today, that's, that's not true. So one of the interesting things, now I'm talking about evidence, is well, where does the evidence-based treatments come from? And you must agree with me, the first part of the world that, that dominates treatments, and it's because of commercial uh, interest in this. It's very rare to get an investigator-driven treatment trial is from North America. That is a long way from Africa, from sub-Saharan Africa and this part of the world. There are, of course, the implications that Afri Afro-Americans uh, are a, a good surrogate for the African population, which is a bit, um, a bit silly, but anyway. Then, of course, you've got Europe. Uh, that's obviously a hotbed. Interestingly, and maybe Pim will agree with me, now there's a schism because Europe used to be all about Western Europe, and now there are trials coming from Eastern Europe. And if you look at the regulatory bodies and you look at uh, the FDA, uh, trials that come predominantly from Eastern Europe are less trusted than from Western Europe. And so they actually say, well, no, you've got a mortality trial here. We want to see it in a Western European or even a North American. Uh, so that's an interesting, and you know Russia and Ukraine uh, are starting to be, whether they like it or not, counted as Western Europe, a European uh, spectrum. Most interestingly, I guess, Australia, uh, from where I come from, 
it is, contributes a lot of, of clinical trials. Uh, but interestingly, I've uh, been involved in the uh, recent uh, analysis of the Paradigm study uh, uh, introduced by Milton Packer and John McMurray uh, with LCZ and dramatic results, but the Australian authorities are not going to approve LCZ in Australia until they see some data in the Australian population. And then, um, obviously, we have the subcontinent and China, and you saw last night when CMU was talking, our next president was talking about Asian-only studies. So what you're starting to see uh, is a development of people saying, OK, uh, how are we going to apply the evidence from Europe and North America when we don't have data from the subcontinent and China and from, e and from Eastern Asia? So you're actually seeing now a movement towards uh, more commercialization. But for most of the southern part of the world, for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for South America, there is a paucity of trial data coming out. And why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because the diverse nature, the cultural uh, nature of sub-Saharan Africa means there is a long, long way from the sort of trials that are being undertaken in the Western world, as it were. So the people from uh, sub-Saharan Africa live completely different and changing lives, and it seems to me that they deserve their own uh, evidence rather than uh, rely on that second hand, if you like, from the rest of the world. So where do most of the guidelines from? I think I'm correct in saying, at least in South Africa, I know there's the adoption of the ESC guidelines, and I note that a lot of the speakers here are affiliated with the Europeans, and obviously with the, uh, the American. There is definitely a very, very strong push by both the American and the American and the Europeans to actually be more engaged in the rest of the world. But interestingly, this, this is from the 2006 guidelines, uh, to say the huge caveats they apply to the evidence that says groups of patients, including high-risk ethnic minority groups, underrepresented in clinical trials and underserved populations, should have clinical screening and therapy in a manner identical to that applied to the broader population. So uh, basically that's a get out of jail card, card they're applying, but uh, it seems to me that's a, that's a pretty broad statement. Interestingly enough though, they would say most physicians regard heart failure primarily as a disease of men, younger and with coronary artery disease. We've said, obviously in Sudan, that may apply as per clinical trials. But there is a huge disconnect, even in high income countries, that heart failure is a serious misreading of the epidemiological and cl clinical evidence. In other words, the, even the trials that they're saying, please apply, actually do apply to really to systolic heart failure. So let me just give you some recent data we've generated from Australia, looking at the burden of heart failure in Australia. And I know this is a complicated trial uh, uh, slide, but just to look, uh, we did an estimate of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction in men, about 315,000, and then 164,000 in women. And then with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you can see the opposite um, effect. In other words, more hypertensive heart failure in women. Uh, and yet the evidence, of course, is very much skewed towards heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And there is still, even in Australia, a misconception that heart failure is predominantly a male condition, as I said, and that's, that's something that has to be uh, addressed. Well, are all heart failure drugs the same? And we do have some data. It's already mentioned about the combination nitrates, hydralazine, in black Africans at least. And this is an interesting study, was looking at the uh, role of beta blockers. Uh, and so looking at uh, black African patients, and so they're saying, well, in, in major trials, there are enormous, I think, clinical differences in the baseline profile of patients uh, entering according to their ethnicity. Uh, 
But interestingly enough, the beta blockers seem to work pretty well in, in both cases. Uh, but once again, that's in a particular etiology of heart failure rather than a diverse etiology of heart failure. Uh, so the key issues here, though, are the cost, and it's already been mentioned, how do you access these drugs? The titration, remembering most clinical trials require up titration to therapeutic doses, and you even have to have monitoring to match the trial setup to get the same results you would in a clinical trial. It's been mentioned about devices. Will do heart failure devices work the same? So this was an analysis of US versus non-US centers in the MADAT CRT. This was mentioned by Professor CMU yesterday. And really, despite baseline differences, there were similar benefits again from um, the application of devices. And I would suggest to you that the devices, because they are more precise on looking at, for example, cardiac dyssynchrony or the risk of sudden cardiac death, that devices would probably be one of the most applicable um, guideline-based treatments that could be applied in any person uh, under the same conditions. The problem you've got, of course, what's the cost-benefit in poorer countries? Just remembering you need to have a high volume of use, you need services, and you need support in a resource-poor environment to achieve the same results. You already saw that there was the individual variability in a judging um, echo parameters for the use of devices last, in last night's lecture. Uh, it would be very problematic and costly to routinely apply devices in the current sub-Saharan context. So, here we have a complexity of heart failure in Africa, and this is something that has to be um, assessed, has to be properly grappled with, I think, uh, to understand uh, how to apply guideline-based therapy. And if you look, I've already seen this, but there is a clear evidence of hypertension uh, or coronary artery disease fueled heart failure in Africa that in actual fact there is a patchwork quilt of high levels of hypertension in some areas where coronary artery disease is starting to appear. Remembering that the treatment of ischemic cardiomyopathies is probably the most evidence rich of anything and remembering that heart failure preserved ejection fraction we are still within an evidence free zone. We know symptomatic treatment with the diuretics, loop diuretics, maybe with spironolactone might work, uh, but beyond that, we are struggling. This has been mentioned, you'll forgive me for mentioning the Heart of Soweto study, a uh, wonderful collaboration, uh, but I just want to quickly go through some of the results there to highlight some of the difficulties we have in applying the evidence. So this was uh, one of the papers we produced, was looking at the crossroads between communicable and non-communicable disease, uh, and really trying to tease out uh, the differences. So here, just in, in women, looking at historically prevalent heart disease, 60% in women, uh, but 65% but with hypertension, you can see that there's a differences based on, on your sex. From black Africans, there were a, a difference. And then using low education, and this is really as a, uh, looking at migrants versus people living in Soweto, that there are differences according to your profile, according to your gender, uh, according to your ethnicity and, and your education. And the critical thing here was hypertensive heart failure was indeed the predominant form of, hype, of um, heart failure we saw but also with coronary artery disease appearing in some cases. So but ischemic cardiomyopathy was, was pretty rare. You could see a range of diseases. We've already talked with Pico about the pericardial disease and also the TB, HIV cardiomyopathies. Um, so this is a very complex figure. Um, and if you break it down even further, and this is what I'm talking about here, about female Sowetans in terms of the uh, originated in Soweto versus migrants and looking at the difference between historical forms of heart disease in Africa, so mainly uh, infectious disease versus the non-communicable disease, including hypertensive heart failure. So among female Sowetans versus migrants, you can see more migrants than 
than Sowetans, the people who have lived there all their life, and you can see a completely different pattern. Can you see here, getting older here, if you survive to older age in Soweto, obviously you are reaching much higher rates of the new non-communicable uh, disease, including hypertensive heart failure, but a completely different picture amongst the migrants still in the younger age groups having more infectious disease. And critically, looking at the numbers, far more numbers of, of patients, uh, female patients with heart disease compared to men overall. And once again, a difference based on whether you're a male, Sowetan, or you were a migrant. And so the issue of, uh, as mentioned, epidemiological transition is enormous. If you look down, and this has been, slide has been shown before, but just quickly showing that based on the rest, so we had a mixed uh, ethnicity, the natural fact there are critical differences in the um, uh, presentation, whether or not you were a black African or the rest. And here is the critical, I think, one here, looking at ischemic cardiomyopathy, very, very rare in the, the African origin, um, but very high, much higher in those from different genders. And, and this, we can actually show you uh, quite a difference in their um, cholesterol profile, their lipid profile. So you might get a high level of low HDL in the black African population with very few treatments. On the other hand, you see the traditional high levels of LDL uh, dysfunction seen in the Western population. And then you can see a sort of reverse here looking at the idiopathic and other causes of cardiomyopathy in the black African population. And then similar has been mentioned, a diversity according to sex. So the profile of, of valvular heart failure, right heart failure seems to be similar, but once again a difference uh, for women versus men. Uh, so there are differences according to your gender. Let's just take the case of right heart failure that has been mentioned. We have very few uh, evidence-based treatments for right heart failure beyond the pure forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So here we have um, the majority of cases, and actual half of cases of right heart failure, really came from uh, a pulmonary arterial hypertension scenario where the uh, evidence base is quite rich, but, now let's be very clear about this, the treatment is extremely expensive, and you do need centres of expertise in right heart failure management to get it right. There's a component, component of rheumatic heart disease and the other causes. But you can see here that, that men were more likely overall to develop right heart failure. But critically, the black African population were far more. It's been mentioned by Albertino, this might have something to do with the altitude of Johannesburg and also the mining that, that goes on. So. I'm going to finish up here as soon as I can, is just to, to give you a quick snapshot of what I think could and couldn't work in heart failure. Well, the first thing that's been mentioned, we need more proactive screening of at-risk populations and treating antecedents, such as hypertension, with cheap drugs or maybe the polypill version in Africa. Remembering you probably don't need to have a statin uh, in that, but you may still decide to do so. We really do, as been said, strengthen primary care and allied healthcare programs. So we need to get the source of the problem uh, rather than treatment at this point. And we definitely need to establish centres of clinical excellence for the management of heart failure in the African context. And that's going to have to be a systematic approach. Uh, and it, it amazes me how the Gates Foundation and other very uh, you know, generous foundations spend a lot of money on trying to uh, uh, build up devices and the really what I would call the sexy interventions when in actual fact it's human capital that's going to work in this situation. It's, if we invest in people then I think that's more likely to have a profound effect on the health, particularly in heart failure. Invest more in prevention and health services than devices at this stage. I'm not against devices but I can't see them working in the most context. And we need to fund and maintain those clinical registries so that we can actually map out what is the heart failure in a particular region and develop the evidence there base. And then funding of clinical trials that purposely target the majority of heart failure, not the minority. In other words, you are actually applying clinical guidelines that have been developed in the minority where the majority of heart failure is now shifted to regions such as the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa.
And I've put this up before, uh, heart failure management survival from multidisciplinary heart failure clinics. And you saw this from Gilson suggested we should have heart failure specialists and teams. It works. And the amazing thing, it works no matter what the type of heart failure a person has. And that's very important because most treatments target a particular pathway. Heart failure actually is a complex um, syndrome, obviously, but heart failure management per se can provide you benefits regardless of the treatment you might apply. And I finish up here now with a picture. This is the face of heart failure in sub-Saharan Africa. This is not the face uh, of granddaughter and daughter in the clinic in Soweto. These people are the ones we need to support. And the evidence base is very poor in how we can best manage these patients because most of the evidence is derived from populations that live thousands of miles from where they live. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon, for this excellent I tried. presentation. Uh, please, first question. Sorry. Yes. So the question is about the African polypo. We're just going to get you a, a, a microphone, Sadiq. Just. Sorry. Well, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, the point you mentioned about the polypo, uh, and I think it suits very well the African population. Uh, these people, of course, uh, especially if it can be affordable. Yes. Uh, Money-wise, and I think uh, you should advocate this and. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, well, may I say that uh, I was very fortunate to go with Karen Sliwa um, to, to London to a Welcome Trust um, uh, meeting. Uh, but the only unfortunate part of that, it was very much about a polypill for, for the sub, uh, subcontinent, Indian subcontinent. Uh, so where we were struggling to find any uh, high levels of cholesterol, obviously there's, there's a different sort of etiology. Uh, and so it was very much driven uh, by an ideology, I think, that wasn't suitable to the African context. But so I think there needs to be a more proactive uh, African voice in the development of the polypill. I think it's more driven from the subcontinent. And that, that really comes down to personalities, I think. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Stewart. It was really interesting. And these two days I have been looking uh, for data which tells us about the situation in Africa. And uh, I think the main problem is, is uh, if we take the political barriers, I don't think it will, it will work. But I think the financial barriers could be overcome by joint venues between scientific institutions and universities. And this will really help to have clinical trials, to have clinical research, and I really hope you will work on this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm probably not the person who can do that drive that most. There are people in the room, uh, Pico and, and Dr. Ogar, Albertino, uh, and other people, because they've started, I think, with, and, and also in Sudan, if you have clinical registries, you have knowledge, then these are the perfect opportunities then for recruiting into clinical trials. Uh, where the issue will come is the funding from that, because the commercial funding for pharmacology, of course, comes from where's the reimbursement. If there's no reimbursement in Africa, then that the, the drug companies are not likely to have a major trial. Uh, so it really comes to me that the World Bank and the other for a development, the African develop, economic development, has to be underpinned by funding of health trials, both in health service interventions and in particular drugs. And for example, the MP trial was, was very profound. Unfortunately, it didn't work, if, you, if you'd like to say. Uh, but that was a, an exam, exemplar of what should be done in the African context. Thank you, Simon. Uh, well, please. Uh, heart failure with preserved systolic function. Yes. Everybody mentioned it's a disease of elderly hypertensive patients. How many of these patients they have underlying coronary artery disease, which are being treated as an hypertensive sure. heart failure? So that was uh, one of the issues from the Heart of Soweto study was, well, uh, 
were those labelled as hypertensive heart disease actually have, um, did they have coronary artery disease? Uh, and a, a good portion of those um, were actually had coronary angiograms and shown to have relatively normal coronary angiograms. Uh, interestingly enough, there was a question about coronary artery disease in younger men. Uh, the work by Anthony Becker showed very clearly uh, that the, in younger men with HIV, uh, positive and smoking had very single focal, he did some really nice um, um, morphology of those, the lesions, showed that they had single vessel disease. Uh, if you did have coronary artery disease, it was more likely to be a left-sided, uh, so the LAD, uh, but at least from Soweto, we were able to exclude a large number of cases with hypertensive heart failure, showing that they had very low cholesterol levels, uh, they were hypertensive, but they didn't seem to have that typical ischemic cardiomyopathy um, and with the flailing segment and the like. So I'd say if you look carefully, majority of those cases are indeed a hypertensive heart failure rather than ischemic, not uh, diagnosed. I have a very short comment. Uh, as she said, we are not talking about politics. But I have to say, I have read in the Gulf News article about uh, exactly two weeks ago about the problems in Africa, and they are estimated that there are billions of dollars in Europe, Switzerland, yes. for ex-African president and some is still yes. in power. So we will be lucky if we can reach some of this money. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, then uh, because of time. Thank you.